Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service this morning, and want to give a special welcome to our first-time guests. Uh, if you are new to South Columbia, my name is Jim Chung, and I'm the associate pastor here. Our mission here is to introduce people to Jesus and to help those who already know him to become more like him. And our vision is to carry out that mission by following Jesus Christ through worship, nurture, and outreach. If you'd like to learn more about our church and the different ministries and events that we have, please check out our website, which you can find at scbcmd.org. Uh, and to help you navigate the service today, please visit our Watch Live page, where you'll find the order of worship, the scripture passage, and the sermon notes as well. As of yet, we do not have a designated time of giving during this service. However, if you'd like to worship through giving and you're here in person, we have an offering box right outside the sanctuary. If you prefer to give online, we invite you to go to our Give page, which outlines all the different ways that you can do that. Um, for the children in the worship service, we have worksheets on the very back pew pertaining to today's sermon. Uh, fill it out and bring it to pastor after the service for a special treat. Um, and also, uh, I want to give uh, a big thank you to those who helped serve and to those who came out for yesterday's family movie night. Uh, it was a great time. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, also, we have um, Operation Christmas Child boxes out uh, in the lobby area. Uh, and you can see Pam Hoots after that, uh, after the service. And I believe we have a short video that we were going to show for that. <laughs> The joy of seeing a child open the boxes for the first time is just, it's incredible. We are so excited. Many of the children receive the shoe box for the first time in their life. We pray that these boxes will be used to bring a lot of happiness and joy, but more importantly, the gospel to each heart, all these little children around the world. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out and bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, and God bless each and every one. I think last year we did right around 50 boxes. I think we can do better than that this year. So uh, please see Ms. Pam Hoots uh, after the service. Um, it's that time where we greet one another. So if you all will please stand, let's greet one another in the love of Christ. And if you're visiting us online, please drop us a comment or a chat so that we can greet you too. Thanks so much.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, today we have a, uh, a holiday of sorts um, as we uh, uh, dress up in costumes and uh, go get candy from uh, strangers and, and not so strangers. And uh, uh, there's also another celebration, Lord, that we celebrate today, and today is uh, Reformation Day. And it's the day where uh, Martin Luther uh, posted his 95 theses and uh, where we, uh, he, set the, he and the, the other reformers looked to set uh, the church right. And so, Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning um, because of some of the giants in the faith that have come before us and people who had great faith to, to stand up to uh, those who were in authority, to, uh, to those who were um, doing harm to your name. And so, Father, we, uh, we pray, Lord, that we would also be people of great faith, Lord, that we would, um, that we would uh, be able to uh, be filled, Lord, uh, with your Holy Spirit, that we would be able to, um, to share your gospel uh, with those who don't know who you are and don't have that relationship with you, Father. Um, and we thank you, Father. Uh, that uh, through the reformers, Lord, uh, that um, we can come to you, Father, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so, Father, we take this time to worship you with all that we are, and we pray, Lord, that you would receive this worship and be pleased with it, Father. We love you, Father. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. 
worshiping with us as we sing 10,000 Reasons. seated. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 6 through 17. 
and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Verse 6, you are alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heavens of heavens with all their light, the earth and everything that is in it, the seas and everything that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly lights bow down before you. You are Lord God, who chose Abraham, who brought him out from Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanites, to give him of the Hizalite and the Amorite of the Perzocite and the Jebusite and the Gergersite to give them to his descendants. And you have fulfilled your promise because you are righteous. You saw the afflicted of our fathers and heard their cry by the Red Sea. Then you performed signs and wonders against the Pharaoh, against all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly toward them, and you made the name for yourself as it stands this day. You divided the sea before them, so they passed through the midst of the sea on dry ground. You hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into the raging waters. And with the pillar of a cloud, you led them by day and with the pillar of fire by night to light them the way in which they were to go. Then you came down from Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws good statutes and commandments. So you made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commandments, statutes, and law through your servant Moses. You provided bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought out water from a rock for their thirst and you told them to enter in order to take possession of the land which you swore to give to them. But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, have mercy, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in mercy, and you did not abandon them. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your unconditional love, your grace, and mercy. We have faith in you, God. We lift up the health, sickness, financial, and relationship needs to you, God. Be with all who are hurting this morning, those who mourn the loss of a loved one. It is in you that we have our trust. Keep us strong, God. Father, be with the minister as he brings your message this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
thank our young people for leading us this morning. I'm so proud of them. Yeah. Uh, especially for the <laughs> especially for the text. Now I I didn't know that song. Um, but uh, I don't know if you knew it or not either, but I didn't know that song. But I was really, really impressed with the message. And so, you know, in Sunday morning when we're singing together, it's, it's not just about the style of music. In fact, that really is the smallest part. It's, it's about what we're singing. And they did an awesome job of picking texts for us this morning um, that magnify and glorify our Lord and who he is. And I'm very grateful for that. Let's take a moment and pray together. Father, thank you for uh, leading us to the cross, and thank you for the cross of Christ. Thank you that there you purchased for us our salvation. Lord, you gave to us this wonderful gift of life where we get to enter into your family and become your children. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I thank you for this opportunity to join together in a community this morning to be able to worship. And we pray, Lord, as we continue uh, to worship you, that your spirit would enable us uh, to hear from your word and that you would help us to apply truth to our lives. Thank you for all that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know what an attribute is? Well, we've been singing about them this morning, and there are several variations of the same definition, but basically an, an attribute is essentially a characteristic or an inherent quality or part of someone or something. Attributes usually define what a person is like, who they are. I was uh, remembering a story about a grandmother and a younger woman who were sitting on the porch one day discussing a family member who had gone astray. And the younger woman said, He's just no good. He's completely untrustworthy and, and lazy on top of that. And the grandmother rocked for a second back and forth and said, yes, but Jesus loves him. The younger woman said, I'm not too sure of that. And the grandmother said, oh, yes, Jesus loves him. And she rocked for a few more seconds and said, of course, Jesus doesn't know him like we do. Actually, that's not true. When we come to talking about God and his attributes, and it's something that we've been taking a look at over the last couple of weeks, we've been considering some of the attributes of God and, and how they impact and affect our lives. And when it comes to the attributes of God, theologians like to divide them into two broad categories, uh, the incommunicable and the communicable. Incommunicable means that there are certain qualities or characteristics or attributes of God that he and he alone possesses. For example, only God is all-present and all-knowing and all-powerful. Only God is self-existent and eternal. Communicable attributes are attributes, his attributes, that he share with us that we can possess them, at least in a, in a, a limited sense, attributes like love and mercy and grace and goodness and, and truthfulness, and, and, and there are others as well. Now, so far, we've considered the awesome power of God's grace, the astounding presence of God's glory, the astonishing perspective of God's sovereignty, and today, I'd like for us to think about the amazing provision of God's forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is not just something God does. It's who he is. In the passage that Daniel read for us, which was a lengthy passage rehearsing God's goodness to the nation of Israel and their rejection of him, and in the midst of that passage, there are several times where Nehemiah affirms, God, you are righteous. Nehemiah prayed, you are a God of forgiveness. God by nature is a forgiving God. I want you to think about that and let it sink in just for a second. God by nature is a forgiving God. And while we assume that we may understand that truth, I, I want us to take some time this morning to consider how that also impacts and affects our lives. Because his forgiveness is a place where other attributes of God, like his compassion and his mercy and his love and his justice, and yes, even his wrath intersect. 
And so as we begin to take a look at it, let's start with just a simple truth. We need to be forgiven. Forgiveness is a relationship word. And it implies that something has gone wrong. If you are driving down the road and you get a flat tire, you usually don't think about forgiving your car. If it rains all day, every day of your week-long beach vacation, you generally don't hold a grudge against the weather. Well, you might, but the weather's not going to care. I know I'm being a little silly, but generally we don't forgive things. We forgive people. Because the need for forgiveness means that brokenness exists, a rupture has occurred, a falling out has happened with someone or someones. And at the heart of this brokenness is sin. Peter once asked the Lord, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Did you catch the connection between sin and forgiveness? How often shall my brother sin and I forgive? Seven times? It's been suggested that the religious leaders of the day of Christ taught that really you only had to forgive someone up to three times. And so whether Peter is being generous or not, I don't know. But Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, I honestly don't think that Jesus was saying that you need to forgive someone 490 times. But on the 491st time, they are out of luck. No, what he's really saying here, you know, Peter's trying to be generous, but Jesus is using a, a, a hyperbole, a statement of, of grace. His point was that there should never be a limit to forgiveness. We should always be willing to forgive. But I want you to hear me carefully. God, who is absolutely and morally perfect, holy and righteous, never needs to be forgiven. He's not the problem. We are. And by we, I mean every human being, including you and me. We need forgiveness because we have sinned against him. We are the ones who are broken. We are the ones who damaged our relationship with God. And folks, that began with our first parents way back in the Garden of Eden. God created a perfect world and put two sinless people in it only to have them disobey his word and rebel against him. You know, as I think about what happened, I can't help but wonder if part of their failure was that they, they didn't understand the nature and character of their creator. They tragically bought into the lie and the deception of the evil one that they could be, what, like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And all it took to be like God was a bite of the fruit from a forbidden tree. They bit. But that bite didn't make them like God's. That bite was a bite of death. God had warned them of the consequences ahead of time, but they rebelled anyway. And when they rebelled, sin entered into the world and brought death with it. And every person since then is born a sinner under the power of death. Very familiar verses. For the wages of sin, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. I think that their failure is our failure even today. God, for example, gives us his word and we ignore it. He commands us, gives us the commandments, and we disobey them. What he says is wrong and sinful and evil, we disregard. And with the height of human arrogance, we do that which is right in our own eyes, trusting in human reasoning, swallowing the same lie that we can be like God, all of which is an evidence that we too fail to grasp the character of God. I like what Ann Dillard wrote many, many years ago. Now she's writing more specifically about people who come to church, but she says, why do people in churches seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package tour of the absolute. On the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke? 
or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it. She says the churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It's madness to wear ladies' straw hats and felt hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. Now, you might think she's gone a little overboard, but she brings up a really, really good point. We treat God as, 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 as if just, in a casual way, as just somebody who is like us. Listen, folks, we are not like God. We're not on equal terms. The playing field is not level. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my thoughts are not your, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You see, God had a right to immediately punish those first human beings by wiping them off the face of the earth. This is what the psalmist affirms when he writes, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If God gave people what they deserve, no one would be able to survive. Because God is holy and righteous and just, he could rightfully choose to exercise judgment on all of us, and there would be no viable complaint against him if he chose to do so. Now, the reason I'm kind of dwelling on this is because we have to have a real and honest understanding of our sinfulness. We, we need to understand that our condition is not just uncomfortable, it's desperate. Because it's only then that we can even begin to understand that God is a forgiving God. The psalmist says, but there is forgiveness with you. And I hope that we can appreciate that from the beginning of the Bible, we're presented with a picture of a God who is involved with his creation, who takes the initiative and makes the provision for the healing of humanity's brokenness. Hip-hop may not be your preferred style of music. And I certainly have no intention of attempting to perform it. But I really do like the, the message of Toby Mack and Lecrae's song, Forgiveness. I think it well expresses our need. They write, because we all make mistakes sometimes, and we've all stepped across that line, but nothing sweeter than the day we find forgiveness. And we all stumble and we fall, bridges burn in the heat of it all, but nothing sweeter than the day, sweeter than the day we call out for forgiveness. We all need, we all need forgiveness. We do all need forgiveness. A second observation I'd make, though, is only God can forgive sin. God is the source of forgiveness. He is forgiveness. Now, God's forgiveness confronts God's holiness and justice, but no way sets them aside. John Piper wrote, all sin is serious because it's against God. He is the one whose glory is injured when we ignore or disobey or blaspheme him. His justice will no more allow him simply to set us free than a human judge can cancel all the debts that a criminal owes to society. The injury done to God's glory by our sin must be repaired so that in justice, his glory shines more brightly. And if we criminals are to go free and be forgiven, there must be some dramatic demonstration that the honor of God is upheld even though former blasphemers are being set free. You see, a God whose nature is to forgive is radically different from gods of other deities and other religions. They're the gods who continually need to be pacified by offerings and sacrifices, which, uh, which you know, horribly uh, included at times human sacrifice or prostitution or self-mutilation. Or consider the gods of ancient mythology who were little better than those who worshipped them. These deities, those deities had no permanent remedy for forgiveness because they were in essence, essence just sinners themselves. Now, if you've ever read Psalm 51, it is a psalm by David of confession and repentance. In fact, the introduction to the psalm says, For the choir director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now, you remember that story where King David 
lusted after a woman and took her illegitimately, and, uh, and she became pregnant with his child. And when he found that out, he tried to have her husband, who was in the army, brought back. Uh, and that didn't work. And so eventually he actually signed the order that ultimate, ultimately resulted in her husband being killed. And then when the husband died, uh, David took Bathsheba as his wife. But the Bible says that which David had done was displeasing to the Lord. Eventually David is confronted with his sin. And to David's credit, even though it was not... Even, even though almost a year had gone by between the time that this had happened and the time that he's confronted, when he was confronted with his sin, uh, to David's credit, he confessed. In fact, Psalm 51 is a, an expression of that confession. And when David was confronted with his sin of adultery, and deception, and murder, he repented and he prayed, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Now listen to this. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Against you and you only have I sinned. And I read that and I go, really? Really? Hadn't David sinned against Bathsheba? Hadn't he sinned against Uriah, her husband? I mean, after all, he's the one who was essentially responsible for having him killed. Didn't David's sin impact his own family and the nation as well? You know, there's this philosophy or thought or claim or whatever that, you know, it's okay to sin as long as what you do doesn't hurt anyone else i got to tell you, that's ridiculous. The consequences of sin, even personal and private, always reach beyond the individual. Against you and you only sin is not a statement of deliberate omission on David's part, but it is the honest realization that all sin is against God. Even when that wickedness is perpetrated against someone else, the act of rebellion is against God's command. In Mark's Gospel, there's an account where Jesus heals a paralyzed man. The friends carried him to Jesus, but there were so many people, and the place was so crowded that the Bible says that they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, let me point out that the religious leaders are absolutely correct in their theology. Only God can forgive a person's sin. By the way, the, the basic meaning in the Bible of forgive is to let it go. Now, there are some wonderful biblical word pictures that describe God's forgiveness. These are probably some that, with which you're familiar. For example, Psalm 103, verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. There the emphasis is on separation. Micah 7, 19, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities under his foot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Emphasis on removal. Jeremiah 31, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The emphasis is on not remembering or not recalling. Isaiah 1, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Here the emphasis is on cleansing. Maybe the religious leaders were even thinking of the 130th Psalm which says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. You see, the problem with the religious leaders was not in their understanding of what God, of what God could do. It's their understanding and awareness of who God was. And so Mark says immediately, Jesus, aware of 
his spirit and that they were reasoning within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up his pallet. And he went out of the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we've not seen anything like this. You see, the healing of this paralyzed man confirmed the authority of Jesus. Anybody could say, be healed, and not actually heal anyone, kind of like some contemporary faith healers. But to tell a bedridden man, get up and walk and actually heal him, it's not so easy. In fact, this miracle, I think, is more about the authority of Jesus to forgive than it is for the power of Jesus to heal. But in this case, our Lord does both. Only God can forgive or pardon. And as one person says, that's the only ground of hope. He said, when we come before God, the ground of our hope is not that we can justify ourselves, not that we can prove that we've not sinned, nor that we can explain our sins away, not that we can even offer up an apology for them. It is only in a frank and full confession and in the hope that God will forgive them. He who does not come in this matter can have no hope of acceptance with God. We need to be forgiven. Only God can forgive. And then thirdly, God's forgiveness is an expression of his grace. Forgiveness is the outworking of God's compassion and grace. Do you remember the story of how Moses went up on the mountain in the presence of God and he was given God's law written, the Bible says, by the finger of God on two tablets of stone? We call those the Ten Commandments. Why they're always in Roman numerals, I have no idea, but the Ten Commandments. Moses had been on the mountain for 40 days, and, and the people thought something bad must have happened to him. So they made themselves an idol, a golden calf, and worshipped it as the God who had brought them out of Egypt. When Moses came down the mountain, the nation was in full-blown party mode. He heard singing and saw the people dancing, and, and in the middle of the celebration, here's this golden calf. Moses was so angry that he raised the two tablets of stone on which were written the commandments above his head, and he smashed them at the base of the mountain. The Bible says he took the calf which they had made, and he burned it with fire and ground it to powder, scattered it over the surface of the water, and made the sons of Israel drink it. Later, God said to Moses, Cut for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets when you shattered, which you shattered. Be ready in the morning and come up to the mountain, come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. And so Moses obeyed. And the Bible says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love, kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. It's interesting to me because this God, who the scripture says punishes the guilty, is also the God who forgives iniquity, the God who is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. Did you catch that in one of the songs we sung this morning? And abounding in loving kindness and truth. Forgiveness is a matter of divine grace. We have no right to expect or demand forgiveness. It's an act of his grace, but we also need to understand that in God's grace and forgiving us, it no way sets aside his justice which demands the punishment of guilty sinners. There, there used to be a television documentary called um, I Almost Got Away With It. And uh, it profiled the true stories of people who committed crimes but initially avoided arrest or capture 
but ultimately ended up being caught. I almost got away with it as a description of what some people think about sin, but the truth is no one gets away with it. No one ever leaves unscathed. Sin always costs something. It always leaves a scar. There are always consequences. At a minimum, if we sin, we lost forever that moment of victory, that opportunity to be obedient. We may get a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance or many, many chances, but we can never recapture that specific point in time ever again. And I realize that, that not every sin carries the same consequences. It's one thing in a fit of anger to badmouth someone with a barrage of profanity and something else to physically assault them and kill them. Each response is equally sinful, but each doesn't necessarily gain the same consequences. Sin is sin, and there's no lesser sin or greater sin because it all falls under God's judgment. Kind of reminds me of an antidote about three pastors who were visiting, they were attending a spiritual enrichment conference. And uh, after one of the sessions on honesty and confession and accountability to one of the pastors confided, brothers, I have a confession to make. I know it's wrong, but I all often struggle with greed. And the other pastor said, brother, I understand what you mean. I, I really struggle too, but my problem is with lust. And the third pastor said, brothers, I too have a besetting sin. I have a problem with gossip. Now you think about that one later. Listen, suppose you did get angry with someone and you said or did something to that person that was wrong. And later you go to that person and you confess your sin and you ask for their forgiveness and they give it to you and your relationship is restored and healed and everything is now as it was before. No harm, no foul, right? You see, the problem is that while in human relationship we might think that forgiveness can be given without any real harm or cost, it doesn't work that way with God. God's perfect nature demands justice. If it did not, then he would seek to be perfect. His holiness, once assaulted, has to be satisfied. His grace, though, doesn't set aside his justice. In the Evangelism Explosion training, it explains it this way. God is merciful, and therefore he doesn't want to punish sin. This is because God is love. And he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. But the same Bible which tells us that God loves us is also the Bible that tells us that God is just and must punish sins. He says, I will by no means clear the guilty. And the soul that sins shall die. So we have a problem. God loves us, but he must punish sin. And God solved this problem for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now that's a truth that we know and a statement we're so familiar with that we can almost just repeat it without thinking. Jesus Christ died for our sins. But folks, it is the heart of the gospel. Do we really appreciate what that means? Jesus died on a cross, the just for the unjust. He substituted his life as a perfect sacrifice for a sinful human race. He paid the penalty of our sin. Apostle Paul says, He made God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf. I think it's interesting, it doesn't say that Jesus became a sinner. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The cross is the intersection of God's grace and justice. To be true to his own person, his justice had to be served and demanded payment for the sin of the world. The affront of his holiness had to be answered, and the outpouring of his wrath had to be satisfied. There's a verse that John says in his first epistle, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, I don't know about you, but propitiation is not a word I use normally in everyday vocabulary. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, he, this particular word is only used twice in the Bible, both by the Apostle John in this letter. Propitiation carries the basic idea of appeasement or satisfaction, specifically toward God. 
It's a two-part act that involves appeasing the wrath of an offended person and being reconciled to him. One commentary put it this way, the necessity of appeasing God is something many religions have in common. In ancient pagan religions as well as in many religions today, the idea is taught that a man appeases God by offering various gifts or sacrifices. However, the Bible teaches that God himself has provided the only means through which his wrath can be appeased and sinful man can be reconciled to him. In the New Testament, the act of propitiation always refers to the work of God, not to the sacrifices or gifts offered by human beings. The reason for this is that human beings are totally incapable of satisfying God's justice except to spend eternity in hell. There are no service, sacrifice, or gift that man can offer that will appease the holy wrath of God or satisfy his perfect justice. The only satisfaction or propitiation that could be acceptable to God and that could reconcile man to him had to be made by God. For this reason, God the Son, Jesus Christ, came into this world in human flesh to be the perfect sacrifice for sin and make atonement or propitiation for the sins of the world. You see, on the cross, God's judgment against sin is poured out on Christ. Where is the evidence that God is a loving and forgiving God, loving, forgiving God? Just look at the cross. Oswald Chambers said, the only basis on which God can forgive us is the tremendous tragedy of the cross of Christ. To base our forgiveness on any other grounds is unconscious blasphemy. The only ground on which God can forgive our sin and reinstate us into his favor is through the cross of Christ. There is no other way. Forgiveness, which is so easy for us to accept, costs the agony of Calvary. We should never take the forgiveness of sin, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and our sanctification and simple faith, and then forget the enormous cost to God that made all of this ours. Forgiveness is the divine miracle of His grace. The cost to God was the cross of Christ. To forgive sin while remaining a holy God, this price had to be paid. I love these words from the Apostle Paul. For a while we were still helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But listen to this. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's grace through Jesus means your sin, my sin, all of our sins forgiven, past, present, and future. Folks, there is no sin that the grace of God cannot forgive. I've known people who thought that they couldn't be forgiven, that what they had done was so bad, so wrong, so horrific, that God couldn't forgive them, and yet nothing could be farther from the truth. There is no sin that the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't cleanse, no sin that God is not willing to forgive. You see, God's forgiveness sets us free. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain, remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. You see, through the indwelling gift of God's spirit, we can be free. What, what does it mean to be set free? Well, forgiveness means that we're set free from the penalty of our sin. But forgiveness also means that we're set free from the power of sin. And through the Holy Spirit, you and I can live lives in victory. Sin no more is the master. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And old things pass away and all things become new. And you know, I, I think it's this aspect of forgiveness that we really fail to grasp. To be a Christian means to be made new. To live a life of continual transformation into Christ's likeness. God forgives us, and that stands our standing, and the term for that is, is justification, but it also now, forgiveness controls our living, and the word for that is sanctification. Forgiveness not only erases our sin, but it empowers us to live godly lives. 
And God's forgiveness even guarantees a future blessing, and that is freedom from the presence of sin or glorification. But there's another dimension to forgiveness. Being forgiven by God means that we can and must forgive others. Do you know that the motive for forgiveness in the Bible is not because people deserve it? Or even if they ask for it? That the motive for you and I to forgive is because we have been forgiven? The Bible says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ's sake has forgiven you. Sometimes someone may say, well, I, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Okay. Then forgive. Forgiveness doesn't mean not remembering. It means letting it go. When the disciples of Jesus asked him to teach them to pray, he said, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven, not will forgive. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Of course, you know that as the Lord's Prayer. And that's where we normally end the passage. But the next couple of verses are, are very telling. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you not forgive others, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your transgressions. We'll unpack that maybe at some other time. But I want you to see how important it is that we forgive because when we are forgiving people, we take on this, this attribute, or not take on, but we, we uh, illustrate, demonstrate this wonderful attribute of God that he is a forgiving God. Because we all make mistakes sometimes and we've all stepped across the line. But nothing sweeter than the day we find forgiveness. And we all stumble and we all fall. Bridges burn in the heat of it all. But nothing sweeter than the day, sweeter than the day we call out for forgiveness. We all need, we all need forgiveness. Let's pray together. Father, it is so humbling to think of a love that's so deep and a grace that is so awesome that you would forgive us. That our sin is washed away. That we have been made clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. That every wrong act, thought, attitude, emotion that we have ever had, that you have forgiven Lord Jesus, I think of your statement on the cross where you cried out, it is finished. Paid in full. Where your sacrifice has paid once and forever our debt that we owe. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you have forgiven us and we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all sin. And that even now, Lord, when we disobey, even now when we do that which is wrong, even now, Lord, when we sin, that we can come in the assurance that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our sin because Jesus has paid for our sin. Lord, we ask today that you would give us grace to live lives in such a way, Lord, that are honoring to you. That sin would become the exception in our Christian life, not the rule. God, that you would give us the grace to, to change and to keep growing and to become more like Christ every day. And then, Lord, what we pray for is your grace in our lives uh, to be forgivers. And that, Lord, that you would help us to be as forgiving as you are. That, Lord, you would uh, empower us, that your forgiveness would make us strong so that, Lord, that we can simply let it go in the lives of other people. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for what the Scripture reminds us this day, that you are a God who forgives, 
that with you there is forgiveness, and we thank you. And as we come to the closing of our gathering together, I ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us individually and together as your community, and that, Lord, whatever you would say to us that we would, that we would hear, and then having heard that we would obey. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to end our, our time together this morning by standing and singing a closing song. And if you're here this morning and you need to talk to someone about what it means to have a relationship with Christ, uh, you're not certain what that means or, or you, you understand that and you've not made that decision, but you want to make it now, then as we're standing and singing, I'm going to ask you to slip out of your, your uh, seat and join me here at the front and we'll take the time that we need to help you understand what that decision means. Maybe there is another decision that you want to share publicly, and if that be the case, we encourage you to come. If you are uh, uh, watching us at home or wherever you are this morning, and there's a decision that you want to make or if there's some spiritual help that we can give, then please contact us and let us know, and we'll respond as soon as we can. Um, of, of all of the blessings that come from knowing Jesus, and there are so many, I want to tell you this morning I'm grateful for his forgiveness. Let's stand together and sing, and you come as the Lord leads. for the assurance this morning that it is indeed in the blood of Christ we stand. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to fellowship together this morning. And as we leave, we pray for your blessing upon us this week. We pray for the opportunity to have gospel conversations with people and tell them about the amazing, amazing, awesome forgiveness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning.